I really hated to not be able to be with you last week. In fact, that had been a plan all along. And then about two weeks prior to our start, I got to looking at my calendar situation and realized that it was going to be a difficult thing to be in two places at one time, especially when there was about an eight-hour drive between those two places that I was supposed to be at at one time. And so left you in the, in the quite capable hands of Trey Clinney. And uh, you got started with a conversation just about how to pray. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've had that conversation over the course of uh, my work in ministry, uh, especially for men who would say, Pastor, I want to pray. I want to pray with my family. and I, I want to spend time in fellowship with God. I just don't know how. And so I hope that you have been well equipped with an, an, something of an outline, some direction as to how to begin to pray, if that has in fact been your experience. I would encourage you to stay close to the Lord's Prayer not as uh, something that you've committed to rote memory and are just mimicking back to the Lord, but something that serves as a framework for you in bringing your requests and petitions before the Lord. What I'd like to do this morning is to motivate you a bit. The reality is that although prayer has been made available to us as followers of Jesus Christ, there are a great many of us who don't spend adequate time in prayer. And just as I often hear the question of how to pray, I, I hear even more often, I, I know I should pray. I have a, a desire on some level to pray, but I, I just don't. I, I hear more often than not that of the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the one where most men, and the same is true for women, are lacking. The reality is that your Bible reading devotional life, absent the discipline of of prayer is, is, is very unlikely to be very devotional at all. In fact, there's not a lot that we're going to do out of communion with God that's going to hold any value whatsoever in life or in ministry. So my hope in the time that we have together this morning is to consider some motivations to ask and answer the question of why we should pray. Why would we pray? What would compel us to spend time in prayer? And I want to offer a series of passages that offer some encouragement to us in this regard. Six motivations for prayer. I'm going to move quickly, so listen quickly. And I'll commit to getting you uh, on your way and headed to work or play or whatever the day holds for you by seven this morning. W what is it that might motivate us to prayer? I'm convinced that if we understood with some depth the great privilege and the power of prayer we might more often run to God in prayer, seeking out that kind of fellowship. Here, here's the first motivation I, I want to offer you this morning. I think that we all know this one, but you can't have a list like this without at least beginning with this discussion. Prayer is a privilege that has been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. In the same way that our access to God in salvation has been afforded us through the sacrifice of Christ, so too the access to God we have in prayer is a privilege that has been afforded us by the blood of Christ. Understand that in our sin, we are separated from God. But through the sacrifice of Jesus, through the message of the gospel, we have been reconciled to God. Not only that we might stand before him justified on the day of judgment, but that we might come before him in desperation and in prayer in the meantime. There is a, a line of thinking, and I think this exists even within the church, that prayer is something that everyone can do and that God is obligated no matter where one may be, no matter what the circumstances might be, he or she find themselves under and God is constrained to listen. But that could not be further from the truth. We have access to God in heaven for one reason alone. By the blood of Jesus, through the high priestly ministry of Christ, we have access to the Father. And it's only through that high priestly ministry we can enjoy that level of access. In a sort of strange and backward way, you have an illustration of this, a demonstration of this in the Catholicism that you see on television or you may have experienced personally or you may have bumped into with friends who practice the Catholic faith. 
it's understood within that context that access is granted through the work of the local priest, the local father. The Bible says, however, that there is one mediator between God and man, the God-man. His name is Jesus Christ. Functionally, in reality, in a biblically sound, theological way, the only access we have to the Father is truly through a priest. Only it's not a priest as they are, identif are identified within that system. It is through the priest, the only priest, our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, 50 and 51, the Bible makes something of an offhand observation about the death of Jesus. What I mean by that is there's not a great deal of detail offered here and there's no lengthy commentary or discussions. Matthew's gospel, so there's an expectation that a Jewish audience would understand full well the import of this observation. But the Bible says there that Jesus shouted again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. This is the moment of his death. And suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rock split. The veil in the sanctuary, that, that wall of separation that existed between the common people and the presence of God in the innermost of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And there are tales of, of how, how strong this curtain was, this veil truly was. The renting of that veil, the tearing of that veil represented the breaking down of barriers that existed between us and the God of heaven. Access has been granted to the very presence of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Number two, God promises to answer our prayers. Surely those answers don't always come in the ways that we've envisioned. But I'm telling you that the God of heaven has promised to answer the prayers of his people. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who searches finds and to the one who knocks the door will be open. What man among you, if his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? God in heaven delights to answer the prayers of his people. Here's a challenge for you. I know not everyone's going to take the challenge, but I'll just dare you a bit. If you're among those who might perhaps doubt God's willingness or desire to answer prayers in your life, I would challenge you just for the next month to begin to journal your prayers. And I don't mean write a lengthy thing. Don't make it the kind of thing that you're not going to uphold. Make it easy. Just write your prayer request, just a list of the prayer needs that you bring before God. You might write them in shorthand. Make it something that's fast and easy so you'll keep it up for a month. And a month from today, I'll challenge you to go back and to read through those requests that you've brought before God and just make a mental note and rejoice at how faithful God has proven to be to answer every need you've brought before him. The trick of Satan is to busy our hearts and minds or when outcomes that we've prayed for come to pass, to, le to lead us to, to worldly conclusions. That no, God hasn't moved in some supernatural way, but the circumstances have changed. Or influence was exerted in a certain way and that brought to pass an outcome that we had hoped for along the way. No, it is that God has moved often through natural means to bring about outcomes that we have sought his face to seek. God promises to answer the prayers of his people. Keep asking and it will be given. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. Here's a third motivation that's closely related to the second. It's not just that God promises to answer our prayers. It is that God has the power to answer our prayers. Prayer is our great source 
of power, not because prayer in and of itself possesses a measure of power, but because of the God to whom we pray. God has the power to answer our prayers. Philippians 4.19 reminds us that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I have chronicled for you, you've been kept up with whether you wanted to or not, our frustrations with our current foster care situation and our hopes to be able to finally adopt the little boy that's now been with us for more than three years. He's in, in child protective services and that system, as many of you know by experience, and if not, at least by reputation, it, it's a mess. And so we, we just, you know, we, we pray and we pray and we pray. And, and I, you know, I've really struggled through the past several weeks in, in First Peter with this notion of submitting to those in positions of authority. There are people, given our case, who enjoy authority over us and make decisions that are deeply impactful for us as a family um, that frankly don't know their head from a hole in the ground. And I wouldn't leave my child in the next room with, and yet they're in a position where they're making decisions about our family structure for the foreseeable future. If you sense a tone of frustration in that statement, you're, you're, you're on the right track. And so what I want to do, what I want to do is, 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 is to begin to push buttons and pull levers and shake bushes and exert influence and from time to time I run across someone who will say you know I know so and so and I, and, I, and and really I think in this situation I could bring to bear the influence of of people in powerful places and there are moments there are times when that is a, an appropriate course of action but I just find myself being reminded again and again and my soul being quieted at the notion that there may be people of influence that I could reach out to and people with power, people with authority that can push the buttons and pull the levers and shake the bushes. But far beyond that, I know the God of heaven and his power exceeds that of every governing authority. And he will see us through for our good and for his glory. It's not just that he can answer prayer, it's that he has the power to see every need through. The possessor of all power, all authority in heaven and in earth is pleading my case before the Father. And he delights to see my good and his glory made known in, in all the earth. God has the power to answer prayer. Here, here, here's the fourth motivation. Prayer is a source of great power for us. We may go to God in prayer and access the power he's made available to us in life and in ministry. Now, in our culture, there is the idea that prayer as a, a, a discipline in and of itself has some power. And I, I always like to say when talking about prayer that prayer has no power. I, I say that in order to sort of create this lean-in effect. Wait a minute, pastor, you're telling us prayer has no power. Prayer in and of itself has no power. Prayer as a discipline in and of itself has zero power. You don't have the ability in prayer to muster this inner strength, the power of self, or even the collective energy, energy of a group of people who pray together. That's the thought in our culture. People send good vibes and positive thoughts and good energy and such things, sending prayers to you. And I always think, well, don't send prayers to me. I don't have, if I could fix it, I would have long since fixed it. But the God to whom we pray as the people of God is powerful. And he's pleased through prayer to afford us the opportunity to avail ourselves of that prayer in some remarkable ways. James 5, 15, the Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will restore him to health. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. 
And for three years and six months, it didn't rain on the land. And he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Elijah was a man like us. And yet he availed himself of the great power of God through the discipline of prayer. Prayer is powerful, not as an end in itself, but as an avenue through which we access the power of our great God who desires to answer our prayers and who has the power to meet every need. Here's a strange example of the power of prayer. In Mark chapter 9, there's a man whose son is sick. In fact, he's possessed by demons, and he comes to, to the disciples first. And the disciples have kind of grown accustomed to the ability to cast out these demons, but they're whipped by this boy's circumstance. Eventually, because it's out of the depth of the disciples, he comes to Jesus. And Jesus is able to cast out this demon so that this boy is delivered from the danger this demonic possession creates for him. And the disciples come to Jesus and they say, now wait a minute. We have enjoyed remarkable power over demons in the past. But this was just 400 level demon possession. We could not manage this situation. And Jesus explains to them this kind. This kind can come, on, come out only by prayer and fasting. Even for those disciples who enjoyed power over demons, Jesus says there are certain kinds of spiritual warfare, a certain level of oppression that is so profound that it can only be overcome by accessing the full measure of God's power through the disciplines of prayer and fasting. Far too often we are hasty in our prayer life. We rush to the prayer closet and we rush just as quickly away. We mouth a brief prayer with very little affection, with very little consideration to the reality that it's the God of heaven that we make our request to and anticipate that that's going to bear a great deal of power. But what Jesus seems to be describing in Mark 9 is one who hunkers down in earnest prayer, who with the spirit of Jacob seeks the face of God and determines within himself that he will not let go of God until he's availed himself of the blessing, or in the case of Mark 9, the great power. Prayer is our greatest source of power. Listen, if, if we really understood this prince, I know, I'm, listen, I know this is what we say, right? And no one would, would doubt this. No, no one would stand and object to this observation or this as a motivation in prayer. But if we really understood the full measure of power we have access to through the discipline of prayer, we wouldn't have enough chairs to seat the men that would be gathered in this room this morning. This is our greatest source of power. And I would have you to give consideration for just a moment to how often it was under great duress, under persecution, and even in the circumstances of martyrdom. The, the, the church didn't call a rally. They didn't have a protest. They didn't create Bible studies or methodologies for navigating persecution and martyrdom, church planning, or missions advancement. They prayed. Brothers and sisters, they prayed. They prayed, and often the room shook. And supernatural things happen. God moved in remarkable ways. We just, we, we are, are, we're going through, we're, I'm doing something different with our boys this year. And, and I think we've determined as a family that every February we're going to read the book of Acts together. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts and there are 28 days. There's a chapter for every day of the month of February. It hasn't been long, we just wrapped that up. We're, we're doing the, the Gospel of Luke now and reading through the New Testament. I've got a short window of time. I wanna make sure that, that my eldest is indoctrinated well before he's off and, and out of my house. And so one chapter a day, we're going through and working through that. Go, going through the book of Acts, it's amazing how often prayer is what they resort to. Prayer is not their last resort, but, but, their, but their first option to go to appeal to the power of Jesus. And there, there's a prayer meeting. Peter's been arrested, and it looks like death is imminent. 
and they gather to pray, and they're praying that Peter would be released. And, and guess who knocks on the door? And there's, and there's a girl that goes and she goes to answer the door. And he says, hey, it's Peter. And she, and she just goes back and says, he must be dead. His ghost is at the door, right? This is unbelievable the way God has moved in a moment. God has, has moved. And resolutions to the challenges that we face supernatural unexplainable resolutions are available to us if we would but go to god in prayer prayer is where we access the power of god here's a fifth motivation prayer is a means of sharing fellowship with god prayer is a place we can go and and speak to god and hear from god I was thinking late last night about ways to demonstrate this from the scripture, and it's, it's tricky. I, I cannot cite you book, chapter, and verse, a passage that says prayer is where we go to fellowship with God in prayer. But there's a book in the Old Testament that has 150 chapters, and it is the chronicle of the people of God who go to God in prayer to enjoy fellowship with him. We're going to talk in a few weeks about praying through the scripture. I would encourage you to spend time in the Psalms just as you took the Lord's prayer and that operates as an outline for you, provides some structure in prayer. It informs the way you move through prayer. Go to the Psalms and, and, and be prompted to pray as you read of these experiences of saints of old who commune with God in prayer. I, I, I think one of the things that's missing from our prayer life oftentimes is, is, is just that our prayer lives are absent silence, just to get alone and to listen for the still small voice of God. Now, I'm always skeptical when someone says, the Lord told me I ought to do this, unless they can cite book, chapter, and verse, I'm always going to be skeptical of that. I always joke, young men come and they tell me, well, the Lord told me to marry so and so and I will say unless her name is Peter or Grace I don't think you found that in the Bible right but the way the Lord stirs in prayer to bring to our remembrance the word of God and the principles of his word that may well help us to navigate the difficult decisions of life is just astounding settle your hearts and minds in prayer Concentrate your thoughts on the reality that in this moment you're in communion with the God of heaven and enjoy the sweetness of fellowship that awaits you there. Here's the sixth and last, just quickly. Prayer enhances our capacity and efficiency in work and in ministry. I wish this were not among the most powerful motivations for me but admittedly, to my shame, it really is. Pray, let me say it again. Listen carefully. Prayer enhances your capacity and your efficiency in work and in ministry. Some of you think that you don't have time to pray. And the fact that you don't have time to pray is the reason you don't have time to do anything else either. Martin Luther, who wrote more than 60,000 pages in his life, he was the great Protestant reformer of the church. He wrote all of the hymns that the church sang in the years after the Reformation. He wrote catechisms for the instruction of children. He preached every day. He translated the Bible into the German language, the common language. More than when he was brought before the Diet of Worms to be tried before the Catholic Council, they, they, they laughed at the accusations that were made because even his accusers could not believe that such mass in, in writing could be produced by one man. They said, so this is just not real. This is far-fetched. The man's a myth. This is not reality. Luther famously observed, I have so much to do that I'll spend the first three hours in prayer. He found that his capacity for work and ministry were enhanced by the time that he spent in prayer. You don't have time to do anything but pray. You don't have, you don't have time because you don't spend 
adequate time. God can do more in a millisecond of your life than you can do with the full 80, 90, or even 100 years that he might be gracious to give you. James 1, 6 and 7 says, let's ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the sea surging, driven and tossed by the wind. This person shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Sometimes the reason we don't enjoy power in prayer, even when we're walking through the mechanics of prayer, is because we don't take the discipline seriously. In the 18th century, there's an old guidepost article about prayer that tells a story of an 18th century abbot who was disciplining two monks for some infractions of the rules. The story doesn't tell what the infractions were, but I would love to know. He imposed on them the rule of silence. They couldn't talk to one another for an extended period of time, and they tried to figure out some way to get around the long hours without speaking some mode of communication. Finally, one of them gathered 28 flat stones from the courtyard and they put different numbers on them and made up this new game they could play with one another. Using gestures, the men agreed on some certain rules, but the most difficult part was keeping silent when one of them scored a victory. They wanted to shout. Even monks have a bit of a spirit of competition, I suppose. But they remembered that they were permitted to say aloud the prayer, the Latin prayer, Dixit Dominus Domino Meo. By using one word of this Latin expression meaning Lord, the winner was able to signal his victory over his opponent. They would simply shout Domino. And the game Dominoes was created in this season of judgment for these two monks for whatever their infractions were. Now they were permitted to do that because it appeared for all who observed them and even for those who listened that they were praying. They were shouting, Domino, Domino, again and again. But in reality, they were just playing a game. And for some of us, especially when it comes to public prayer, it looks as though we're praying to the God of the universe, but the reality is we're just playing a game. And I want you to know, to be moved by the notion that as we bow in prayer, we access the power of our God. We commune with the very God of heaven. If that can't move us, if that doesn't drive us to our knees in prayer, brothers, I don't know what will. So let's bow together in a moment of prayer. God of heaven and earth, Lord of all the universe, one who holds the power to see through our every need, who knows us inside and out better than we know ourselves, we commit this day to you. Ask God that you would be pleased to use us, that others would know Jesus. Help us to walk with you, God, we are sinners. God, I pray that you would help us to be holy today as you are holy. That you would forgive us of our sins, those already committed with this brief morning, and those that perhaps lie ahead in the day before us. I pray that you would help us to be like your son, Jesus. To love and live and lead like Christ. I pray, God that throughout the day you would keep us in prayerful meditation, th that you would help us to pray without ceasing, that in the quiet moments the still small voice of God would speak, that the principles of your word would be brought to our memory, that you'd help us in the moment of temptation to remember your word and your command for us. Help us to walk in humility God, I, I pray that you would do the supernatural, God, that, that today you'd, you'd give us opportunity, Lord, to see you answer prayer in a powerful and undeniable way. I, I pray, God, that as we lift the needs of others, those that we care about, the concerns that are most pressing for us, that you'd be pleased to answer them and further prevail over our pride and our egotism, the notion that we can 
control the outcomes or the circumstances of our life. We impress ourselves at times, Lord, that there are things that we can fix. And then we bring to you what remains, those things beyond our control. The reality is that our, our very life, is be, the breath that we breathe is beyond our control. Give us a childlike faith and dependence on you. God, I pray that this morning would serve as a milestone moment for us when we were renewed in our passion for prayer. That, Lord, a pattern for life would establish itself in us that would carry us for the rest of our days. You are worthy of worship and all praise. And, God, it is our desire to be near to you. So often we're overcome by the cares of this world. Help us, Lord, to remember that you're good, awaiting our petition that we might enjoy this fellowship with you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, have a great day. Tell someone about Jesus today.